So the lights are about to dim, uh, but before we do, what are we going to see? Well, I'm not going to tell you uh, specifically. I'm going to tell you who it is. It's Simon Swain. Many of you will know. Uh, last year we had uh, the Cold War uh, simulator emulator experience. Well, it's something in the same vein. Uh, it. I think it's also very important to note, as those lights dim, I feel like I'm at the Oscars and I've, <laughs> I've worn out my welcome, that everything you're about to see is coming live out of the browser. There's nothing pre can or pre chewed this is, So this is on top of everything else, an example of the kind of real-time capabilities of the web browser. So I'm not going to tell you any more. I'm simply going to introduce Simon Swain. The year is 2048. 30 years ago, we outsourced the very runnings of our lives to machines. Machines that learn. The machines learned too well. Today, all computing resource on the planet has been consolidated in a vast maze, hewn out of solid rock. No humans have access to the maze, but the warm glow of its reactors make an ideal home for millions of flesh-eating rats. <laughs> Your mission is to enter the maze, sabotage the power source of the machines, and free the human race from its self-inflicted, automated prison. You are our last best hope, but until today, no human has survived the maze of the rats. <laughs> to defeat the machines, first we must understand the machines. Computer memory is the meeting point between the real and the virtual. We implement memory using a capacitor. A capacitor is a passive electronic component that holds a charge. We apply a charge to our capacitor, and the charge decays over time. If we nominate a charge above a certain threshold as representing a binary one, and below a certain threshold as representing a binary zero, we can store the value of one bit of information in our capacitor. If we automate the process of periodically refreshing the charge on our capacitor, we can store the value of our bit in memory for as long as we have a supply of power. Now, one bit on its own is only so useful. So typically, we arrange our bits together in a collection of eight, called a byte. A byte can hold any one of 256 possible values. You could use this value to represent a number, a letter of the alphabet, a shade of gray. The possibilities are almost limitless. By manipulating the bits within our byte, we can perform some interesting operations. If we shift all the bits in our byte to the left or the right by one position, we can multiply or divide the value of our byte by two with almost no effort. But a single byte on its own is not so useful. So typically, we arrange our bytes together into a collection we call a bank of memory. We use our memory to store a representation of whatever problem we happen to be working on. Now, a bank of memory is not so useful unless you can individually access the bytes within that memory. To do this, we use a technique called the address bus. We index our memory from zero up to the number of bytes we have. We place the index of the byte we wish to access on our address bus, and we can read or write that byte at our leisure. Modern computers use the same principle, but with a much wider address bus, giving us access to an almost incomprehensible amount of memory. We have a bank of memory. We use it to store a representation of whatever problem we happen to be working on. 
We apply algorithms to that representation in the hope of finding a solution. Logically, our memory is linear, arranged in one dimension, indexed from zero up to the number of bytes we have. But the problem space we wish to operate on may not be one-dimensional. We may wish to operate on a two-dimensional grid, with each cell in the grid being referenced by an XY coordinate. In this case, we can use a simple formula to translate between the XY coordinates that refer to the cells in the grid and the zero indexed memory location that holds the information about each cell. This allows us to effectively abstract away the underlying implementation of our memory and refer to the problem space in our own terms making it much easier for us to reason about the algorithms we're going to apply. Some of the earliest algorithms we taught the machines were pathetically trivial. This example is called a drunken walk. We start in the center of our memory space, and we move in a random direction, up, down, left, or right. As we enter a memory location, we clear out its value, much like if you were digging out rocks from a cavern under the ground. If you leave it running long enough, you will clear out all of your memory. There is a veritable smorgasbord of algorithms we taught the machines. But they all converged on one point. They taught our machines to be effective predators. The representation we've used so far has a major drawback. We're using one memory location to hold the information about each cell. We're using that cell's position to determine which its neighbors are. Now, this seems fine, but it denies us the ability to say two cells are not connected together. We can make a small change to our representation. As well as storing information about the content of each cell, we can store a list of the indexes of the neighbors each cell is connected to. This gives us the ability to have runs of cells that are connected together and cells that are completely isolated from their neighbors, giving us access to a whole new class of powerful algorithms. Teaching the machines these algorithms was our worst mistake. Start with a grid of unconnected cells. Pick a cell at random, any cell will do. Pick a neighbor of that cell at random, ensuring that that neighbor has no connection to any of its neighbors. Create a mutual connection between the two cells. Place our starting point onto a list of places we visited. And repeat the process from our neighboring cell. As we work through our grid, we'll build up a list of the places we visited. Eventually, we will get to the point where there are no more cells to explore. We work back along our list, following up any unconnected cells we find. When there's nothing left in our list, we know we have formed a perfect maze. This little algorithm works on a grid of any size and gives us a perfect maze every time. So if we have a maze, how do we solve a maze? We must have an ingress and an egress, an origin and a destination. We expand the search frontier from our origin through every connected cell we can find. As we explore, we record the place we came from and calculate a score for each cell based on the distance we've traveled. If for a given path there are no more cells to explore, we terminate the search on that path. If we've reached our destination, our search is complete, and we use the list of places we came from to determine our route. We can enhance this algorithm by adding a heuristic to the score for each cell, based roughly on the distance from that cell to our destination. And by searching on a path with the lowest overall score, we can complete our search quickly. This is what we taught the machines. And now, we pay 
a price. Human hackers have penetrated the machine's networks and obtained some basic information on the configuration of their defenses. Before you enter the maze, we'll provide you a brief overview of what we know so far. The machines hide deep in their maze from where they control our world, disable their power to free all humans. Each maze has a reactor. Find the reactor. Sabotage it. Escape. Follow markers to reach your goal. Follow markers to reach your goal. Follow markers to reach your goal. We have identified three primary variants of vermin inhabiting the maze. The killer rat, the breeder rat, and the baby rat. Superior machine engineering creates Rat breeding factories. <coughs> Destroy rats, have no mercy. In a tight situation, your super zapper will help you survive. Before you enter the maze, we will provide a brief training simulation to enhance your skills. Are you ready? You look ready. <laughs> Maze number one. This is the easy one. Maze number two. You're in a long maze of twisty passages, <laughs> all alike. There is an exit to the east. Maze number three. Follow markers to reach your goal. <laughs> Could this be our goal? Uh-oh. 
silly humans, you will never defeat the machines. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.